inspired by this. This is something you find in the 21st century. And what I remember, and he told a different story, but I remember a story that was d depicted in this, in this documentary about a man who started chatting with a young girl and fell in love with her. Okay, they had an online relationship and she sent him these pictures and she was so beautiful and you know she sent him pictures in a bikini and she was so sweet and he totally fell in love with her. I mean he was totally attached to this girl and it went on for month and month. He had this Im incredible perception of this beautiful girl. His whole life was taken up by his attachment towards this girl until he found out she didn't exist. It was her mom. Well, the girl existed, but she, she didn't chat with the guy. Her mom, who had some mental problems, it, it turned out, who was not at all pretty and beautiful. You know, in fact, she was quite elderly and obese and, you know, had a lot of mental problems. And she wrote to this guy. And in his mind, he was so attached to this girl. It was a total fantasy. She didn't even exist. So then he found out it was all a fantasy. And I was thinking, that must be one of the quickest methods to eliminate attachment. <laughs> it's just no, it's not there, right? It's not there. So I don't know how quick I've never been, you know, I never had a crush on someone online. But the thing is, our mind is actually quite similar. It creates things about the person. You know, when we, uh, when we are attached to someone, we create as a fantasy world. That's also, we do see some parts of reality, but our attachment, when it's there, it also creates its own story. And that is not there, and that cannot be found. But as long as there's an actual person, we believe it is there. Whereas in this case, it was lucky. <laughs> there was no one in the first place. It was so obvious to this guy that this didn't exist. Because, of course, there was the girl. All right, there was this pretty girl. Uh, but that was not what he had fallen in love with. That was just the pic pretty pictures and so forth. But he was talking to this woman and sharing his thoughts. And, you know, and he had this fantasy of this beautiful kind of like understanding girl. It was just this elderly woman pretending. And there's another story in India that happened in India. So this story is actually better even, I think. The story that he told, our teacher told us, he was talking about this young girl chatting to a guy online. And again, they fell in love and they had all this relationship. And then one day, her brother contacted the man and said, because in India, you, you, if you, if you uh, have a, a relationship out of marriage before, before getting married, so if the guy, it's usually the fault is seen in the guy, and you can, you can, by law, you can uh, take steps against this person, like making promises, having an, uh, an illegit, uh, uh, what's the word? Illegit, illegit, uh, illegit uh, relationship. What's the word? Uh, anyway, so having a kind of relationship out of marriage and so forth. So the, the husband, ca this, this guy can be punished. And so the brother contacted the guy and told him, you had a relationship with my, with my, with my sister. This is not okay. Uh, you, out of marriage, I'm going to go to court. I'm going to uh, uh, have you arrested and so forth. So he threatened the guy to such a degree. He told him, you have to give me money unless you pay me. I'm going to go to the court. You're going to go to prison. And apparently there is this danger if you start that relationship as a guy with possibly an underage girl. I'm not sure. Um, you can go to prison. So the guy was so desperate, he committed suicide. But as it turned out, there was no sister. There was never a woman. It was the brother who pretended to be this girl. Oh, wow, right? <laughs> Terrible. So there was never a girl. It's even worse than the mother. At least there was a mother. There was a woman. But <laughs> here it was, a, it was a guy, you know? It's just a guy pretending to be this girl. And this guy totally fell in love with this girl. So, of course, however terrible this is, but it's just showing how our mind can conjure up all these fantasies about someone. We haven't even met them. We fill in the gaps and then kind of exaggerate because it makes us feel good. So our mind just, so that's attachment. That's attachment. So we use these extreme examples. And I usually give an example that people, makes people laugh. I mean, it's my own kind of case. You know, when I had a crush on someone, when I was like, you know, 14, 15, I, I had a crush on a guy. And my sense of this guy was such, he was so great. Even his backpack was great. You know, he had like a backpack. It was just an ordinary backpack. But because he was great, everything about him, so the greatness kind of permeated out 
into his backpack, you know? His clothes, everything about him was great. His shoes were greater than everyone else's. You know, this is how fashion starts. You have a crush on a guy and the shoes that he wears become part of this greatness. Anyway, and the way the, the what happened was I never got together with this person. So, and then I didn't meet him again. We never got together. And a year later, I met him again. And I was thinking, what was I thinking? What did I see in this guy? So the fact that I had that thought, now I understand it because I, was, I didn't see reality. I saw things in this guy that he didn't have. My, my attachment made this. So my misperception just made up this person that wasn't actually there. Right? So that is true for attachment. Our attachment fantasizes. It projects. It projects all sorts of greatnesses on things. Yes. Yes, yes. Peace. Jonathan. Um, I would argue that still... Uh, Mm -hmm. that did exist a uh, real proof of attachment, even though they were two complete fantasies. For the perceiver, and I would ask you... Uh -huh. For the perceiver, it was reality, yes, I agree. Okay. But does it seem that way? In the sense that they are merely uh, something that the illusion of the eye projects on another object. Yes, yes, exactly. Well, I mean, the, the thing is like, there's nothing wrong with wishing for something, okay? So, wishing for something is different to attachment. I, I think it's important, so desire, afflictive desire and attachment are different things. Now, first of all, what you said previously, our, to our attachment, this is true, this is reality. Right? But we're not aware of it. That's the problem. We don't, we are not attached to the attachment. We're attached to that which the, which, which the attachment wrongly tells us has the qualities. Like I'm saying, I saw qualities in a person that actually weren't there. I use the example of the internet when you chat with a person, you know, like this, per this is just an extreme example. You actually can totally fall in love with someone who is not there, someone pretending you know, to be this. So this is the most obvious way in which it's totally just a fantasy. But still, the moment you realize this person is not there, the attachment is gone, right? Jonathan, would you still be attached to a person you've fallen in love with if you found out it was your, your elderly neighbor, the kind of crampy, cranky kind of elderly 50-year-old guy who pretended to be this woman? Could you still be in love with that woman? No way. <laughs> I mean, we can't, I mean, seriously, if we, we, we should try to imagine. We can totally fall in love with someone who pretends to be someone, but actually turns out to be, right? And right away, we understand there's no reality over there from the side of the person. It's totally just, I'm just giving an extreme example here, because it's easier to understand it then. But of course, that's not always true. There is usually a person on the basis of which, but the stronger our attachment, the more we can see it's just a projection of the mind. And we don't find this from the side of the object. And when we recognize it, the attachment will go. And there's nothing wrong with attachment itself, except that it creates so many problems. It creates so much worry. It creates anxiety. The stronger the attachment, the stronger the worry. Now, with regard to attachment towards enlightenment, that's just as bad. That's just as bad. So if there is, uh, if there is attachment towards enlightenment, forget it. I mean, if it's unrealistic, then it's just replacing the object. The emotion is the same. But, of course, here the idea would be to be realistic. So, of course, instead of attachment, you can, you can replace attachment for love. That's okay. To love a person, that's different. That is a realistic emotion. Quite similar. It sees the positive qualities of the person without exaggerating it. And just wishing the person to be well, wishing that person to be happy, that we could call love. But the moment we exaggerate the positive qualities, and instead of wishing that person to be well, we wish that person to make us well, then we have a problem, right? So it's, attachment is almost like an exaggerated version of love. Like love is based on reality, it's based on what's there, the person has positive qualities and good qualities, but 
we we don't just focus on the negative qualities except instead we are tolerant of the negative qualities but also see the positive and sincerely wish them to be happy so buddhahood would be if there's an attachment exaggerating the positiveness well forget it but a, a, an a intelligent way of dealing with buddhahood is like seeing it for what it is it's a state in which we can help others in in the most effective way it's a way in which we have utilized our ultimate potential and then seeing it for what it is and realistically we just wish for it by applying the causes and conditions okay so there's a difference there's always there's always something found similar to attachment that is based in reality that's what we're aiming for attachment is just an exaggerated sense of reality leading to an, an exaggerated emotion anger is similar to attachment except it's the opposite, exactly. It's the opposite. So again, it focuses in on a separate type of person, but now focuses on the negative quality, blows up that negative quality, exaggerates that, doesn't see the good quality any longer, right? I don't know, I've, I've, I'm reminded of a situation when you're really angry with someone, and then someone comes along and says, well, no, don't be so angry with, I don't know, this person, whoever. They have really good qualities. And you're like, don't tell me about the good qualities. I'm really angry with them. <laughs> it's almost like your anger cannot, cannot remain if you're reminded of a good quality. If you just heard this person saved a thousand lives, very difficult to be angry. Because right away, you see another side. You see positive qualities. And how can you be angry with seeing? So the point is here, anger can only remain if you just see the negativity. That's one extreme because no one is just totally negative. Everyone has positive qualities. And on top of that, it, it ex exaggerates those qualities. Duran, yeah. Unlike attachment yeah. to a person, mm -hmm. to a person, to some degree. Mm -hmm. No, Duran, that's not it. That's not it. If you study more in detail, there is a text called the Pramanavatika, especially the second chapter. It's about establishing that Buddhahood is possible, proving that. It's not just about he hearsay. That's not enough. Someone telling me, oh, maybe there is planet da-da-da. Why would I want to go there? I don't even know it exists. Someone telling me is not enough. Well, first of all, the thing is, if, if I say so, that's true. But if someone like his Holmes the Dalai Lama tells you, don't trust him when he tells you he doesn't know what Buddhahood is. I mean, we have these incredible lamas, and I personally believe that there are Buddhas around us. That some of the lamas are Buddhas. Like Buddha Shakyamuni, we believe Buddha Shakyamuni lived 2,600 years ago. What did he different from the Dalai Lama? What did he, what was extra that Buddha Shakyamuni did that the Dalai Lama doesn't do, that His Holiness the Kamapa doesn't do, that many of the great lamas don't do. I mean, I, I believe if there are any Buddhas, then it's them. Okay, so they don't say they're Buddhas. Okay, that's difficult. But they present us with reasonings. They present us with reasonings. And actually right now, we cannot prove that, that they're, they're, they're Buddhas. But honestly, if I want to challenge you, in Buddhism, we sometimes have the problem, well, we cannot prove their past and future lives. We cannot prove there's karma. I don't know there's karma. I don't know. I cannot have faith in that just because someone tells us. <laughs> we have faith in so much just because someone tells us. I mean, a guy with a fancy PhD tells us da, 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 <laughs> and we believe it. I think science is the new religion, you know? It's like for the Buddhists, like 2,600 years ago, Whoa, this guy is a Buddhist, you know, it's a Buddha. Someone said that, everyone believed it, that was enough, those were the credentials, enough credentials, and everyone believed it. So nowadays it's with scientists like that. But of course, both are wrong. You shouldn't just believe it just because a guy is said to be special. We shouldn't believe just some scientist, right, just because they have a fancy PhD. I mean, if I talk to people, you know, online, oh, I've just read, did you know? 
I know da da da. Oh, we don't know. We just read it. We just read the information. We don't need to understand it. Uh, usually I say, well, I don't know the, wor the world is round. I've not seen it first sight because I've never been in a space rocket. Um, and then the reasonings. There are reasonings you can definitely utilize. You can reasonings that establish the, that the planet is round. Does anyone know the reasoning? Here? Okay, so at least someone knows. So oftentimes I, I talk to a class where no one knows what the reasoning is for <laughs> planet Earth is round. Everyone believes it, right? Everyone believes it. It's like, do you have any doubt about it? No, no, no. Earth, planet Earth is round. Scientists have proven it. It goes to the degree that they say Big Bang exists, existed. It's a theory, right? It's a theory. It's called the theory of the Big Bang. It hasn't even been proven yet, but everyone believes it, right? So basically, we find that very acceptable, but then with Buddhahood, we have a huge problem. But actually, it's good to have a huge problem with Buddhahood. There should be a problem with Buddhahood. But in the same way, we shouldn't believe everything we hear. Right? I mean, this whole thing, we, b we Google it and we believe it. Yeah. yeah? So the, the problem is we believe things. So much of what we say, we know. We don't know. We just believe it. Seriously. We don't know the day we were born. We don't know because we don't remember. We don't know so much about what we've done. I mean, we were just told by other people and we have no reason to disbelieve them. So we trust our parents on that. And we probably, well, trust me, I met one person once. Her birthday actually wasn't on the 25th of May. It just wasn't convenient for her parents to celebrate it on that day. So they <laughs> changed it. <laughs> and when she was like elderly, I, I always told them the story because the Holmes the Dalai Lama oftentimes uses this as an example of faith. We have faith we were born on a certain day. We believe that our parents had no reason to lie, so we trust them and we believe that. Well, we have papers. Papers! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you... But this, in this case, the birth certificate was fake because the parents put in the wrong date. And trust me, if you're born in India, there's a lot you can do with a birth certificate. <laughs> I know sufficient, there were a lot of Tibetans who just kind of very convenient subtracted a few years of their age. You know, most Tibetans subtract five years. So come on, birth certificate. Most Tibetans don't know when they were born. So if there's like a whole class born on the 1st of January, you do get suspicious, right? <laughs> so the point is, it doesn't prove anything. It doesn't prove anything. But we still trust our parents. They had no reason to lie to us. And as I said, I actually met once when I was teaching in the US, I met a girl who said, oh, you know what's funny? My parents just told me I actually wasn't born on May 25th. It was 24th. <laughs> Something on that day just didn't, didn't work out well, so they had to change it. I don't, I don't I remember, don't remember the reason. Maybe old grandmothers had the birthday on the same day and they didn't want it to be on the same day. I don't remember, but they changed it. So my point is, likewise, the Buddha is someone who sets forth certain teachings that we may find beneficial, right? Similar to our parents who teach us things, they want to benefit us. So a Buddha, likewise, is someone who teaches us something that may have enabled us to deal with situations in life that previously were very difficult. So why would he lie to us about Buddhahood? Right? Why would he lie about it? Why would he lie about it? And the point is like, if in the end there is no Buddhahood, the practices that he makes us do are still very, very beneficial, so it doesn't matter. You see what I'm saying? So if you aim for Buddhahood, it means you have to practice incredible care and love and compassion for others. And the best way to be happy yourself is to make others happy. So in the end, if there's no Buddhahood, I don't care. Right? If there is, great. So I work towards it. I, I hope I can reach that state and I hope I can practice accordingly. But even if there isn't, the reward is great enough in itself. So that's my point here. But there are also actually proofs for Buddhahood. But you need to go through them. It takes time. It's a bit like if you want to know that the planet Earth is round, you probably have to study some mathematics. You have to take certain steps. It's not like someone sits down with you for 10 minutes and you get it. It's not that easy. Right? So it takes time. Anyway, returning back to this. Yes, Lior. Should I leave it for later? If you can. Sure. Good. All right, so attachment. Uh, we've just heard how attachment works. We've heard how anger works. Then, arrogance. 
Attachment basically just exaggerates the qualities of another person or of a specific object. So please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't have relationships. So there will always be a degree of attachment. But the greater the degree of uh, attachment, the greater our suffering. So if you can decrease the attachment, the happier you are, the less worried you are. I mean, I think one very good example of attachment is jealousy. Those are good friends. Okay? So I give you one example of someone who once said to me, this person, she was so attached to her husband, uh, she said to me, don't you do anything with my husband? No? Don't you do anything? And I was like, why would I do that? Well, because you probably fall in love with him. And I'm like, no. And she's like, of course, because she thought he was so great, everyone has to fall in love with him. So she was worried that I would fall in love with him. And she was so worried that when he went to have uh, drinks with his female colleagues, she was always worried they would fall in love with him. Why? Because she had the sense this is like an objectively wonderful person and everyone must see him that way. But that's just not true. So this, this worry, this kind of jealousy, like, oh my God, everyone will have a crush. It's not going to happen because not everyone sees the person the same way, because not everyone has the same extorted, yes, distorted view of who they are, right? Luckily, because <laughs> otherwise, yeah, it would be a really good reason to be jealous. <laughs> okay, I mean, I'm talking about that kind of jealousy, when there really is no reason, but you suspect everyone. It just shows how the mind exaggerates. Okay, anyway, so that's anger, aversion, or sorry, that's attachment, then there's anger, so that's how they work. Arrogance, what does arrogance do? It doesn't take a quality in another person, it takes a quality that we possess. And again, it blows it up. It blows it up. We totally focus on that and we feel puffed up about it. We feel kind of full of ourselves. Kind of puffed up is the, uh, the Tibetan word, or full of ourselves. We feel we're inf uh, superior to others. So first of all, we don't see that whatever quality we have is a result of others, right? I mean, there's really nothing in our life that we can say, I can totally take the credit for it. No one had anything to do with it. Think of any quality you have. If you're very loving, very kind, it's probably to, due to some influence, you know, back home, someone who's been an inspiration to you. Um, if there's any, what else, any education, well, without books, without teachers, you would have never gotten there. So you can't give yourself the, the only credit. You have to be proud, you have to be feel arrogant or feel proud of your teachers, of everyone who's involved, of those people who taught your teachers, etc. Right? In, in actuality, that's what it is. But it feels like I'm like that. I'm a little better. I have this quality. As if there was an independent kind of good quality that no one else had anything to do with it. And then I exaggerate that and feel really full of myself. Is that realistic? Not at all. It's not realistic, is it? Okay. So that's arrogance. And then there are eight or seven different types of arrogance. You can read those. Then there's, the mis there's ignorance, misperception. We already mentioned it. So misperception of all sorts of things. Okay? And you can read them and those are clear. Then there's afflictive doubt. Now, actually, doubt is a good thing. Doubt is something positive. To doubt things, to, to have a sense of skepticism. Remember we talked about it initially? So to doubt that things are like this and not like that. But there can also be a negative type of doubt. When you always doubt everything, you never come to some kind of decision. Now that's difficult. That can be afflictive. So it's a kind of doubt that is described as, um, is described as uh, undecisiveness in the way that it's an, it's an obstacle to any kind of spiritual development because even their correct reasonings, it is impossible to come to some kind of conclusion because we always waver always wavering, never come to some kind of decision, yes, it's like this and this is worthwhile, etc. Um, and so there's a Tibetan saying that expresses exactly the, the destructiveness of that kind of doubt. The saying is that just as one cannot saw, one cannot stitch with a two-pointed needle, one cannot attain a goal with a doubting two-pointed mind. Right? So we cannot stitch with a two-pointed needle. Likewise, when we're, when we're always doubting, we can never go one direction. Oh, my back should go there. We never accomplish anything. So therefore, there is a time for doubt. It is good to have doubt. But eventually, we, come, we should come to a conclusion it's like this and not like that and move on. 
So new doubt may arise, that's good. But if we're stuck with one kind of doubt all the time, very difficult to actually move on from there. And this is true spiritually, and this is also true in, in everyday life. Is it better to be a teacher or doctor? Teacher or doctor? Teacher or doctor? <laughs> You're never going to be a teacher or doctor, right? Okay. Then there are the, so these are the five kind of uh, afflictions called like the five non-views. And then there are five views. So the view of the transitory collection, really weird uh, kind of name. But basically, if page 54, so it just speaks of the view of a self, an inherent I, the view that there is an intrinsic I, an intrinsic mind, right? Which is kind of the foundation for all our problems. That is called the view of the transitory collection, when it's directed towards the I. And then the view holding to extremes, which means on the basis of the previous view, when you have a sense there's an intrinsic I and therefore the I has always existed in the same way and it's permanent and unchanging. That's a view of extreme or the extreme that the I will totally go out of existence as in like becomes non-existence at the time of death for example. Okay, so the, the, the sense that there's not an ever-changing I but that there's either an I that's permanent or an I that doesn't exist altogether as like when you die there's a sense you go totally out of existence. Both are extremes. Right? Then there's a belief in the supremacy of wrong views. When we hold wrong views believing that those are supreme. Okay, so I have a sense of oh I held this view and this is a supreme view. That's also a type of wrong view. Holding wrong views as supreme. And then believe in the supremacy of mistaken ethics and religious conduct. This is also important that it's very dangerous actually to, to perceive certain actions that are harmful as being beneficial and seeing them as religious practices. So one example I gave here, uh, for example, in the Christian tradition, one finds the practice of corporal mortification. I don't even know what that is really. I can only see an image of like, yeah, like whipping yourself. So it's a way of um, getting yourself closer to God, it says here. I actually, I, I think I looked it up on a, on a Christian website. This means self-inflicted pain and physical harm, such as beating, whipping, piercing, or cutting oneself. It is felt that these practices will help the practitioner attain union with God, right? Obtain a place in heaven, etc. So, I mean, just for the sake of self-mortification, um, if it's, there's a different motivation, that may be different, but if there's a sense just kind of torturing yourself or bring you closer to a spiritual kind of special state, well, unfortunately, that is a view, believe in the supremacy of mistaken ethics and religious conduct. So a mistaken religious conduct. In the Hindu tradition, for example, you find examples of people thinking if you stand on one leg, uh, surrounded by five fires, four in each direction, and number five is the sun. If you stand on one leg for long enough, you will attain liberation. Whoa. Uh, so again, that's definitely from. Oh really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, interesting. Ah. Uh, yeah, I mean animal sacri. Ah, that. Uh, okay, well, there yeah, are animal sacrifices actually in Nepal. <gasps> it's terrible. They have this, this day when, when everyone needs to sacrifice an animal. And they say that the, the streets of Kathmandu, they're covered in blood. So a rich family kills uh, a bull, a kind of um, middle class family would kill a goat. Uh, a, 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 a poor family kills a chicken and one of my teacher once told me they were taking a flight on that day and before the flight took off they killed a chicken and threw it against the plane Ooh, and kind of covered the plane in blood oh it was gross so the streets of Kathmandu are actually soaked in blood so that is seen as a religious practice you know and in the many cultures and of course you know killing other people and being reborn in heaven and so forth i mean all these are mistaken views i mean it's just going to give you more suffering but not going to create any liberation and so forth so these views exist in many different cultures i'm sure in buddhism i'm sure you have traditional kind of well where where it's not a buddhist practice in buddhist societies where there are views of certain activities bringing you liberation but actually they don't 
I can't think of something right now, but I'm sure traditionally there is something like there are mistaken kind of practices uh, which are mistakenly seen as part of a night nectar. So that's actually quite dangerous because you, in the name of religion, you cause a lot of suffering towards others, for others, and of course for yourself too. Okay. And then there's wrong view in general, which actually includes any kind of wrong view, so I don't even know why it's mentioned separately. Okay, so those are the six or the ten. So six, you can talk of like six root afflictions, where you take the first five, attachment, anger, arrogance, afflictive doubt and ignorance, and then you just say wrong view. And then wrong view can be again subdivided into those five. So you have six or ten kind of main afflictions. So those are the main ones, but then there are other ones, such as aggression. So you can read about aggression. So aggression is just an extended form of anger. Or uh, resentment, resenting someone. It's a, it seems a subtler type of anger. This is on page 55 and then 56. Concealment, spite, jealousy, miserliness, pretension, and... Some of the words here, they're a little bit difficult because uh, we use like everyday kind of words and they don't have necessarily a negative connotation, but here the way they're used, uh, it, it needs to be specified that they're based on one of the afflictions. Uh, dissimulation, dissimulation just means pretending or feigning to be someone. Haughtiness is a kind of arrogance. Harmfulness is clear. Shamelessness, what does that mean? Uh, shamelessness, that, that doesn't mean like, of course, there's a sense with like, <coughs> It's, it's not always negative to not feel ashamed, right? I mean, why, there's certain things we don't need to feel shameful about. But here's a specific type here that needs to be explained. It's a type of ignorance, anger, or attachment, which is devoid of a sense of shame with regard to one's negative actions. So it has to be specified. Or a lack of embarrassment, or lack of consideration or embarrassment, when one doesn't feel embarrassed or considerate with regard to harming others. Uh, then there's excitement, one other ones. I, I won't read all of them, but excitement here, being ex feeling excited is not really negative, but here's a mental factor, it's a type of attachment. Scatters the mind so that it's unable to remain focused on one object. That's a kind of negative uh, kind of excitement. Um, Non-faith is, uh, non is a type of uh, negative mind that does not inspire to do something positive. So lacking the aspiration to do something positive is called non-faith. So please don't be um, put off by the names of these afflictions, but when you read what they refer to, they're basically certain types of afflictions that disturb the mind and potentially lead to problems and difficulties. All right. So this should suffice in terms of the, the different types of afflictions, as in like the ten uh, or the six root afflictions, well, there are different ways of talking about them. There are three poisons, the three kind of poisons, anger, attachment, and ignorance. And then more extensive explanation of those would be the six types of afflictions, which add arrogance, afflictive doubt, ignorance. Um, and then, uh, uh, sorry, wrong, wrong view. And then even more extensive would be the ten types. So three, six, or ten kind of main afflictions. And then the secondary ones, which here are only mentioned to be 20, but actually how many do they say usually there are? 84,000. <laughs> and that is just a big number. <laughs> and it's not, I mean, it's not even saying there's a limit. Yeah, of course. So. <laughs> Took me a day to memorize them. No, I mean, there's no names given to them. It's just said to be 84,000. So like a huge amount of different ones. And... They're all based in one way or another. They're a type of attachment, a type of anger, or a type of ignorance. But there's so many different varieties. And I guess we each personally have our own special ones <laughs> that you know are special in terms of how they get at their objects. Oh, like I said previously, with regard to these different afflictions, in particular anger and attachment. So I said we can differentiate between them from the point of view of their objects and what they do with the objects. So with anger, I haven't been specific enough. So anger, for example, uh, the object is an exaggerated form of negativity, and it then wants to be separated from the object or possibly harm the object. There's a wish of wanting to harm or a wish to be just separate from this object. So this is what it does with the object. It's the sense, I just want to be separated from it, and in an extreme of a ver the extremer version of aggression, for example, we actually want to harm that being. 
or whatever we associate, the, like the being that we associate the negative qualities with. Okay, attachment is the opposite. It perceives some positive qualities, something uh, exaggerates the positive, and doesn't want to be separated from it. It holds on to it. It wishes to be close, as close as possible. Okay, that's attachment. So you see how they all function slightly differently. Jealousy. What is jealousy? Jealousy takes a positive quality in another person. So attachment takes a positive quality in another person and wants to have it. Anger takes a negative kind of quality and wants to be separate. Arrogance sees a positive quality within oneself and blows, up, blows it up and feels attached towards it. Jealousy sees something positive in another person and feels angry. Right? Jealousy sees a quality in another person, totally blows it up. Right? We focus in on something. No one else would think it's so desirable. But we would take a quality or an ability or what else? Uh, possession or something. Something that someone possesses. Um, so something that someone possesses and then we want that. And we exaggerate the, the positiveness of that. We exaggerate that and then are angry that they have it and instead we want it. Right? That's jealousy. Yes? Is attachment sort of one uh, mind or, or, or is it like one mind loves the person and the other gets attached? Yeah. This is the process. I kind of explained it previously, but you were you had gone for a moment, so I'll say again. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. No, you, you didn't know. You missed that part. But basically, it's like it's a process of like first, there's a misperception of reality, of how I exist, how the other person exists. So it perceives an inherent I that's inherently more precious than everyone else. So therefore, that which is mine, that which is good for me, seems to also be more important and more precious. And then we look at another person and perceive them as inherently being such and such. And if they can provide some intrinsic kind of good quality, then we, we, we exaggerate that, we exaggerate its importance. That is all the steps that lead to, that those are not attachment yet. So it's called the improper attitude. There's a, a word for it. First there's the misperception, and then the improper attitude is a mind that just exaggerates the positiveness of something. And attachment attaches. It does all this together. So this is important. Those steps are important. All right. Anyway, okay. And I didn't explain it to that degree, so it's okay. <laughs> so it's just to add a little bit to that. All right. Then, so the Buddhist scriptures outline another three types of attachment, uh, at three types of craving. So really, here just mentions different types of looking at something similar, but here craving is described. And also, a, a small note I made here is uh, concerns different traditions. So in the Mahayana tradition, the root of suffering is described as the misperception of reality. In the Theravada tradition, it is craving. There's more emphasis on craving. But that's not contradictory. Because craving can only arise if there's a misperception. So it doesn't contradict that. And craving is also seen as one of the main. So desire or craving is definitely one of the, the, the roots of suffering. Why? Because there's desire or craving towards one's own happiness. That underlies everything. So in the Theravada tradition, it just stresses uh, the craving more. In the, in, the, in the Mahayana tradition, it, cr it stresses more the misperception, but there's no contradiction. Okay? All right. And then craving, it, uh, in, in Buddhist scriptures, there are, three, uh, there are three types of craving. Craving of sense pleasures, fearful craving, and craving existence. So craving sense pleasures, we're all familiar with that. Craving the objects of the senses. And then fearful craving is, fearful craving, it kind of means that one craves the absence of sufferings, cannot bear sufferings. So instead of patience, as the root in Hebrew, right, suffering, it is craving to be like total, like uh, uh, an obsessive kind of, oh my God, no suffering. Okay, it's a, t a craving, being fearful of experienced suffering, and then craving existence, craving existence. So that type of craving arises at the time of death in particular. Because when we're dying, in particular when the death is, is slightly slow, when it's like a, a gun to the head. I don't know. I don't know whether there's time. Unfortunately, there's no one really to ask. Uh, there's time to think, oh, bummer, I'm dying. Right? Oh, that's it. 
right? I was thinking like when this plane broke up uh, in, in Egypt, I was thinking like while I was in the plane <laughs> going from Paris to Israel, I was thinking, oh, that would be, be a perfect plane to put in a bomb <laughs> for several reasons. So, okay, would I have time to think, bummer, <laughs> I'm in the wrong plane <laughs> when it breaks up. <laughs> I was thinking, I hope, because from a Buddhist point of view, it's important to have a positive thought. So I was thinking, will I have the time? <laughs> will there be time to have that thought, right? So, anyway, but I don't know. It could be, yeah, it could be that there's a moment. It seems so instant, but like even a tiny second may be enough thinking, oh, bummer. So, therefore, basically the idea is that there will always be a moment of craving. Like, oh my God, I'm going out of existence. So, of course, we, we are always conscious. The thought, the, the idea that we can be unconscious, this is misleading. We are never unconscious. We're always conscious. The only thing is we don't remember when we wake up again because a subtler mind has arisen. It's like when, when, we, when we are sleeping, during deep sleep, a subtler awareness arises and it's conscious. But we... Our coarser awareness has not learned to become aware of subtler awarenesses. Sometimes we are aware of dreams, of course. Uh, sometimes we are more aware, sometimes we are less aware. But we're just not trained in that, so we do not remember when we were sleeping and we do not remember when we were unconscious. We're, we're actually not unconscious because we always have consciousness and consciousness always has an object and it always perceives an object. So the claim would be that even when we're dying, when someone shoots us in the head, there'll be still thought, right? The consciousness continues on. And of course, this has also been illustrated by, I, I mentioned it earlier, near-death experiences. When from the doctor's point of view, the person is gone. But from the patient's point of view, they're very much there. Very vivid experiences. And when they come back, then of course they can share with us what the experiences they had. So actually, it seems... There's a sense that you just blank and nothing happens. But that's probably, that's not the case, actually. From a Buddhist point of view, impossible. And like I said, near-death experiences seem to, to prove that. But just not remembering doesn't mean it didn't happen. Also, like, during the time of sleep. Anyway, the point is here that there is a moment when we die. There's a sense, of course, death just means consciousness leaves the body. That's what... Death is defined as. So you separate from your body. And when this process takes place, there's a sense, I'm disappearing. Because we are very strongly identified with our body. When we leave the body, there's a sense we're disappearing. And there's a strong craving. Oh no, I don't want to disappear. I don't know whether you ever had a time. I only remember once when I was walking in Macau Ganj towards my room. And I was walking, there was this kind of steeper street. And a truck came towards me. And I was a little bit in the, the, the truck was so big, I had to move to the side. And suddenly it started swaying towards me. And I, I mean, nothing would have happened, but I didn't realize it seemed to squash me in that moment. And I thought like, oh no. <laughs> so, oh my God, I'm going to die or something. I had this thought in my mind. And I was definitely like this, no, <laughs> cannot happen. So definitely very strong craving. And everything else was not important in that moment, just to be. So I experienced a very strong sense of craving for existence. So that is what said to trigger the karma that throws us in the next life. <laughs> that. Right? Okay. Anyway, grasping at existence. All right. And then the process of generating the afflictions. Well, I've basically spoken about it before to some degree. So the process of generating the afflictions. Well, it's basically the misperception of reality. The misperception of the I, it's on page 61, so the misperception of the I, the I seems to inher exist inherently, intrinsically, and then everything is judged accordingly. But what's very interesting is first there's a sense of I, separate I, and then others. So it seems to be intrinsically, it's not relative, for us it's not relative, I is here and others are over there, of course you are I and other both. From my perspective, you're other. From your own perspective, you're I. But to me, you're only other. You're intrinsically other. You're never as important as me. Right? So you're intrinsically other. So you're always separate. So since there's this is close and this is far, this is more precious. So after the misperception of an intrinsic I, there's a misperception that this is more precious. This is closer, 
to my consciousness, my awareness. Therefore, this is more precious, more important, and therefore mine is more important. My happiness is more important. My suffering is more tragic. Right? So everything is judged accordingly from now on. You benefit that I, so that is seen as more precious. So that's called the improper attitude. From the misperception, you have what is called the improper attitude. It's also a type of misperception, but it's just given a different name to differentiate between the two. So I is more important. I'm more important. I